Okay, second half of chapter 12, After Manos. I'm just going to dive right in and, um, whew, let's see, I think after this, just one more, one more episode after this. Here we go. Diane Marie Reisted. Diane found out that her Volkswagen van engine problems were covered under warranty. So she got a new engine, and by the time the Manos filming was over, she and her friend were ready to hit the road again. After a couple of years, she had saved up some money and was planning on going to Europe with a friend ticket already in hand. Instead, she found herself in New York, standing in front of the desk of modeling agency executive Eileen Ford. Someone had passed along Diane's photo to the agency, and she was summoned for an interview. Diane was already several years older than most of the models that Ford represented, and she wasn't really sure she was interested in a modeling career. She actually tried to decline, but decided to give it a shot. It turned out that Diane had a unique and highly valuable style, both for her youthful looks and her chameleon-like ability to morph into a different image for a variety of magazine print ads and television commercials. Her 15-year high-end modeling career throughout the 1970s took her around the world. She was buddies with Bridget Bardot in France, she dated Cat Stevens, and she met artist Salvador Dali in his home in Spain and partied with Jerry Hall and Mick Jagger. She was even a visitor to the Playboy Mansion. Diane finds it eternally amusing to realize the thing she is best known for is her role as Maggie in Monos when she was only 21 years old. She never acted again. Today, she owns an antique store and lives in Colorado. William Bryan Jennings continued performing around El Paso for women's civics groups and his church, welcoming any opportunity to sing. He continued his private law practice, maintaining his independence instead of working for a more lucrative large law firm until his retirement, and then gave up any aspirations he may have had for, for movie making, perhaps because of his experience with Monos. I think he was happy to let it lie after its short run and not revisit it, said his son, Brian, when asked how his father felt about the film. It wasn't really his proudest moment. Of course, no one brought it up until MST3K showed it in 93, and then whenever anyone mentioned its new popularity, at least when I was around, he just kind of shook his head in disbelief and never really said much. Brian remembers his dad as a guy who liked to play sheriff with his kids and other folk, always letting us know what we did or said that was wrong. Bill was a gentleman until riled, and then he could be pretty rough. But the mono sheriff always had a, a broad sense of humor, pulled a lot of jokes, and made up many of his own, much as his son Brian does today. He always enjoyed being on stage, literally or figuratively. He was pretty honest and principled in all his business dealings and everything else. So if you had a tail light out, he would tell you to get it fixed and might or might not let you off with just a warning. Bill passed away in December 2005. Anselm Spring. The young mono set photographer found his first fame while in El Paso, <clears throat> about the time he was on set for Monos. Through the Mannequin Manor girls, he met another young model from the same school who Anselm thought to be photographically perfect. She had a wonderful spirit and an all-American girl look. Her name was Susan Blakely, and her dad was stationed at Fort Bliss. Anselm sent her photos to a German tabloid looking for a German Miss Soldier Bride, and Susan's photos won the first prize. 
From there, her image was seen by Eileen Ford in New York, the same modeling agency that would discover Diane Marie a couple years later. Susan Blakely went on to a successful acting career and is probably best known today for her performances in The Towering Inferno, 1974, and Airport 79. Although Manos didn't directly influence Susan Blakely's career, it did have a hand in guiding Anselm. He wasn't happy with many of the photographs he'd taken on the mono set, so he began experimenting with them in the photo lab. Burning the slides with a candle or a match and then re-photographing them on another type of film. Seeing a call for photo submissions in popular photography magazine, Anselm sent in his experimental photos which were published in April 1967. Two of them were artistic <clears throat> renderings of the Master and Torgo. After returning to Germany, Anselm launched a successful career in fashion photography, but he found it artistically unfulfilling and dabbled in music for a while, forming a band that performed all around Germany. He eventually returned to his first love of photography and has published numerous books traveling the world to capture his subject matter. Today, he is still honing his art from his studio atop a mesa in Escalante, Utah. Robert R. Smith, Jr. The mono score composer continued to write music and work through the UTEP Speech and Drama Department for another 10 years after Monos had been mostly forgotten. He wrote the musical for an original musical, Border Crossings, with book and lyrics by Dr. Gifford Wingate, performed at the McGoffin Auditorium in November 1971. Bob's musical score showed great talent and reviewers said that some of his songs could have stood on their own. Two especially stood out, Border Crossing, and On the Loom of Autumn. In July 1976, Bob collaborated again with Wingate for a production called Family. According to several who knew him, including Pat Little Dog, Bob Goodry's ex-wife, Bob had engaged in the drug scene as many others did in the 60s and developed a particular fondness for LSD. He discovered a spiritual reality where drug-induced ideas and personal experiences began affecting his daily life. One close friend remembers being hired for a gig where Bob was to be the piano player but just never showed up. Later, Bob told him that on the way to the club, his back began to hurt so badly that he saw it as a sign or an omen that he should not play that night. Bob had always considered himself a Christian but once he started going out into the desert alone to drop acid, he began experiencing powerful spiritual visions. On one of his most memorable trips, he returned with a story of seeing Jesus, who came down in a spacecraft and told Bob to give it all up and give his life to God. He abruptly stopped taking drugs, drinking, and playing music. He believed God didn't want him to play piano anymore, so he sold his baby grand to buy a revival tent and left El Paso to preach the word of God around the Southwest. Nicky Mathis Singer Nicky Mathis continued to perform in El Paso as a jazz vocalist and received her graduate equivalency diploma in 1971 while raising two boys as a single mom. She attended the University of Texas at El Paso before moving to New York and attending State University at Buffalo. She received her Master of Education degree from Harvard Graduate School of Education in 1980 with a focus on social policy, communications, and community organization. In 1985, Nikki formed her own African American jazz band with former Hollywood arranger Jim Argyro. In 1987, she became, became a founding member for the Many Colors of a Woman, a Hartford, Connecticut jazz festival showcasing women's contrib contribution to jazz through female instrumental musicians, vocalists, poets, 
storytellers, dancers, actors, and comedians. The, fe the festival has helped establish Hartford as a hub of cultural entertainment. Uh-oh. It's not working. <laughs> yes, it is. Are we sure it wasn't working? You're just going to have to put it with me. This is my third time doing this one. <sighs> the festivals helped establish Hartford as a hub of cultural entertainment, and Nikki continues to participate and to perform. She is also enjoying her newfound notoriety for being one of the very best things about Monos. It's true. She's agreed to reprise her vocals for the upcoming sequel, Monos Returns. Tom Naiman. Dad continued to act at the Festival Theater and in 1972 became the paid director of the company for about a year. After my parents divorced in 1972, he left Texas for California and a job as director of the Ontario California Boys Club. He remarried and moved farther north to Petaluma, California and then farthest north just 50 miles south of the Canadian border in the Cascade Mountains. His last move before retirement took him to Western Oregon where he found work as a handyman for many years. Much of Dad's art is lost to the annuals of time. Some of his pieces he abandoned in haste in the 90s at a small art gallery owned by friends in the tiny town of Winthrop, Washington. He had placed them there on consignment when he and his family were living there, trying to make a go of far northern life. When Dad and his family moved away on short notice, he left with the intention of going back to collect them, and he never did. I would love to have any one of those pieces, but I've resigned myself to revisiting them on stream each time I watch Monos. Dad, his wife and my half-sister Ivy eventually moved to the same small town where my sister Julie and her family had settled and where I moved my family in 2000. Even my mother moved from Texas to be closer to Julie and me. The wives. Virtually nothing is known of the women who played the wives. Probably most of them would prefer not to be found. In my research, I was able to track down two of them, Stephanie Nielsen and Sherry Proctor. Stephanie played the head wife who was beaten by the master for her outspoken nature and for daring to defend the child. She went on to a career in entertainment in the gaming industry. While working at the Las Vegas Silverbird Casino in 1978, she was the first to headline Tina Turner in a major casino showroom. She later became Vice President of Entertainment at Resorts Atlantic City Hotel. Sherry Proctor had pretty much forgotten about Monos until sometime in the late 90s when her daughter gave her a copy of the MST3K version for Christmas. She watched it with her family and they got a lot of laughs, with her kids agreeing that the fight scene with their mom was most realistic. She raised three children as a single mom and became the first single parent president of the New Mexico State Parents and Teachers Association. In her 50s, Sherry earned two BS degrees, one in hotel, restaurant, and tourism management, and another in criminal justice at New Mexico State University, and an associate degree in fine arts. She became the first female director of football operations at NMSU and the second female in the United States to hold that position. She is now retired and lives in New Mexico. And since I finished, this, that's the end of that chapter, but since I've written this book, I met another of the wives, uh, Isela Garcia. She lives in El Paso, I think, but um, We've been, we've been friends for a while now, and I get to talk to her from time to time, and I just spoke to her like a week ago from this recording, and she's doing quite well. So hopefully we'll have more about her. Uh, I've got one more episode, and I'll finish this book, and then after that, I'll, I think I'll keep doing some of this.
We'll tell some mono stories, get you up to date, and talk about some of the things and people and, and all that I learned since I wrote this book. So looking forward and see you next time and the last time for this project.